Uh, honorable delegates, aloha, good morning. We have five renowned speakers and two hours within which to carry out one of the most important discussions in contemporary maritime security. That is the role of international law and dispute settlement in Asia Pacific waters with a specific focus on the South China Sea. So I will therefore be brief here in my remarks. The overall trends in maritime dispute settlement in the Asia Pacific are generally positive. And these track the larger trajectory that over the half of the world's maritime boundaries have now been delimited. As highlighted yesterday by Admiral Verma and Commodore Ali, South Asia is leading the region in legal best practices. Bangladesh in particular has delimited its maritime boundaries by harnessing the rule of law and dispute settlement with both India and Myanmar. And India has welcomed the verdict, a point which must be underscored as the Indian acceptance of the Bay of Bengal judgment must be seen as an example of a global power adhering to and hereby strengthening the international rule of law. Similar cooperative endeavors of late have taken place between Indonesia and the Philippines and even Russia and Norway. Of course, the South China Sea is a different matter. The Philippines v. China arbitration remains a double-edged sword for the rule of international law in an area of distinct tension. As many of you know, China has refused to appear before the arbitral board, one comprised of the most authoritative set of judges, perhaps ever, ever assembled, in a law of a sea proceeding. As was mentioned yesterday by Professor Wong, China is not legally obligated to appear before the arbitration tribunal. But of far greater importance than that procedural rule, China is obligated to comply with the verdict as the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea treaty member. And so the pivotal question that arises here is, what role can dispute settlement play in this and other contested maritime areas if legal compliance with controversial verdicts may be compromised? How far may states go to be the judge of their own cases, regardless of the possible role of history in a case and its relationship with the modern law of the sea as expressed through the UNCLOS Treaty. To sort out the role of international law, dispute settlement, and maritime security in the South China Sea and areas beyond, we have assembled an expert international panel. First, we'll have Dr. Don Emerson from Stanford University, an authority on Southeast Asia, who will speak to these issues from the vantage point of Vietnam and the Philippines, though obviously not from an official perspective. We will then turn to Dr. Nong Hong, who holds a position at the National Institute for South China Sea Studies, and will speak to China's perspective on the role of law and dispute settlement in the area. This is followed by Colonel Ramil Nick from the National Defense University in Malaysia, discussing this from a Malaysian perspective. Dr. James Kraska, Professor of International Law at the Naval War College, will explain US views in an unofficial capacity on these key issues. And we will wrap up with Dr. Mark Valencia, former senior fellow at the East-West Center and distinguished maritime policy analyst who will outline largely the challenges associated with different practices and interp interpretations in states' exclusive economic zones. We will be very rigid with time. We will have 15 minutes maximum for each presentation, and I would encourage less as the audience will want to ask many questions. So with that in mind, we will turn it over to Don Emerson to begin, please. I want to begin by thanking the organizers of this event for having invited me to attend and to share some thoughts. <clears throat> I'm particularly happy to be back in Canada. I remember vividly the decision made by the Canadian government to support a workshop, an annual workshop on the South China Sea that began in 1990 and is still going on, and its impresario is with us here today, Hashim Jalal, in some ways a father of the law of the sea, uh, whose expertise vastly exceeds my own and he will be speaking later in the meeting. I also want to thank personally Brett and Brian and Michelle for assistance rendered in the last couple of days. <clears throat> My theme is introspection and empathy missing in action in the South China Sea. I want to argue that those two aspects, the lack of introspection and the lack of empathy, are playing an important role in preventing uh, a solution to the problem, or even an alleviation of the tension that unfortunately uh, 
it has been rising in the South China Sea. I want to begin with Mao. Mao said a lot of things and he did a lot of things. This one thing that he said, I fully agree with. We must never adopt an arrogant attitude of great power chauvinism. Every nation, big or small, has its strong and weak points. I think that's absolutely spot on. China is a big country and other countries are small countries and that's just a fact. Many of you will recognize this quote because it was from the epical event, the unfortunately epical event that occurred in Hanoi in 2010 when China's foreign minister made this statement uh, as a consequence of his concern, indeed his anger, at what the American Secretary of State had said on that particular occasion, which was essentially that the United States has a, quote, national interest, unquote, in freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. Now, my job is to share with you some information and some impressions of some Southeast Asian countries' positions and involvements in the South China Sea. I want to emphasize from the very outset that I am a partisan of absolutely none of those positions. I am an academic uh, and glad to be outside of the fray, outside of the arena, looking in. I actually want to begin uh, following up on the contrast between the statements made by Chairman Mao on the one hand and the foreign minister on the other by involving a Singapore view of China's style in de dealing with the South China Sea issues. Many of you know Kausikan Bilahari, uh, former uh, permanent secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Singapore and presently uh, one of their ambassadors at large, who recently, just a few weeks ago, uh, published a piece in which he commented on his experience in dealing with Chinese diplomats with regard to the South China Sea. He recalled the occasion some years earlier when at an ASEAN meeting with China, a younger Singaporean diplomat had made a statement of Singapore's position on the South China Sea without criticizing China. And after the speech was over and they broke for coffee, a Chinese representative from the foreign ministry approached him and said, and I quote, because I'm quoting Kausikan Bilahari, uh, and said to him, silence is golden. Now, Bilahari comments in his article that he didn't really understand what the Chinese meant by silence is golden, but if they meant to silence the view of a very small country, a very, very small country, the smallest country in Southeast Asia by size, then perhaps that was not a successful example of Chinese diplomacy. He was very cautious in what he said. On another occasion, he recalled that the Prime Minister of Singapore had made some comments on the dispute in the East China Sea. And after that, the Chinese representative said, that the Prime Minister of Singapore had angered the Chinese people, that the Chinese people had been made angry by what he had said. And frankly, I've read what he said. It wasn't incendiary at all. And again, Bilahari comments that he's not sure how the Chinese diplomat knew the emotions of 1.4 billion Chinese uh, by saying this, that the Chinese people were angered. You see where I'm headed. The style in which the discussion takes place really has some impact on the credibility of the speakers and on the likelihood of achieving the kind of mutual respect which China has persistently emphasized as a necessary ingredient of the new model of relations between great powers. Unfortunately, missing in that discourse is any evidence of a new model of relations between great powers and small powers. And Southeast Asia, the Indonesians only partially accepted, consists of small powers. <clears throat> now, I want to suggest that there are a number of different ways to turn to a positive kind of looking forward in which cooperation might segue into conflict in the South China Sea. 
And I'm just going to run through these very quickly because I don't have time to investigate them in detail, but it seems to me useful to stretch them out so that one can at least, you know, balance them and consider which ones might have uh, the best sort of, you know, cost-benefit ratio, which ones would be the least realistic, and so forth. Now, pragmatic negotiation among relevant parties is the Chinese position, but the real question is, what are the relevant parties? And the Chinese say the relevant parties are those that have claims. The case of Indonesia, which I will not investigate, is an interesting outlier here because although they do not claim land features in the South China Sea, there is uh, an overlap between the Nine Dash Line and some portion of the EEZ that Indonesia has that has been recognized east of the island of Natuna. Unfortunately, I'm not going to spend much time talking about the Indonesian position. Now, who are the relevant parties? We have just heard on the previous panel the important information that the hydrocarbon payoff in the South China Sea should not be exaggerated. That actually, in a global context, it really amounts to something that's relatively minor, okay? That the real problems are much more on the surface of the sea, where the trade, this incredibly valuable trade, takes place. What is it, $5 trillion worth of trade annually crosses the South China Sea? Now, of that $5 trillion, roughly one-fifth, that is roughly $1 trillion, is American trade, trade that either goes to the United States and that goes from the United States. Now, the United States is not a claimant in the South China Sea. It is a user. So in all of this discussion of relevant parties, what happens to the role of the users? Even Laos <laughs> depends upon the South China Sea, even though it doesn't have a coast. Is it possible to develop some sort of arrangement in which the users also could be constructively involved in a settlement because they are stakeholders in the South China Sea. It seems to me that that question of relevant parties is absolutely central and needs to be explored if China's position, its preference for pragmatic negotiation, is to succeed. Not to mention, of course, the limitation involved in bilateral negotiations, which China insists upon, rather than multilateral ones, because if you involve the users, necessarily the negotiations have to be multilateral, okay? Now, joint or unilateral recourse to international law. This, of course, brings to mind the Philippine suit. I will refrain from commenting on the Philippine suit. It would take us into subclauses of UNCLOS that I would prefer to stay out of for lack of time. But I do want to suggest that of the claimants in the South China Sea, the Philippines has distinguished itself by clearly going out beyond the South China Sea to appeal to users and institutions way outside of Southeast Asia, and not just the arbitral court that is meeting uh, as we speak to discuss the Philippine suit, but even the United Nations General Assembly, because as many of you know, the Philippines very recently decided to submit its triple action plan, which I'll show you in a second, to the UNGA, knowing, of course, that even if the UNGA supports that plan, it has no real effect because the decision would be a mere resolution uh, it could not be enforced. And so if the Philippines is trying to pursue a kind of quote-unquote moral high road by involving outsiders, and China is, of course, resisting this. The question here is whether Vietnam will follow the Philippine suit, uh, follow suit, if you will, and submit its own suit. That is being debated in Hanoi. Perhaps we could discuss the possibilities in that regard during the Q&A. Now, there is, of course, also the question of deterrence, to try to achieve a stable balance of deterrence. There was a stable balance of a deterrence that occurred, was fairly effective in a way, during the Cold War. Could something like that be reestablished? I think the Vietnamese are considering that as a possibility because they are acquiring advanced submarines, uh, clearly in relation to the threat that China poses to them in their eyes. And the question then remains, will this be simply the classical security dilemma a spiral into conflict, or will it establish a stable balance of power? But at least it is one option worth keeping in mind. Moving quickly through uh, some of the others, the question of extension number four, this is essentially the Chinese strategy, in my judgment. Unilateral, incremental extensions of de facto control creating an irreversible new normal. I could go into the details of that, uh, many of them already known to you. A salutary clash sounds really terrible, but maybe it'll take a crisis, including some hopefully minor loss of life, to trigger enough realization of the urgency uh, that needs uh, to be felt in all of the relevant capitals, 
uh, in order to alleviate conflict and, if possible, resolve the issue. And then finally, of course, let's not forget that someday there could be a unilateral act of seizure to oust all of the existing occupants with the exception of a single actor who would then have dominance, literal control over all of the land features in the South China Sea. <clears throat> now I want to shift quickly to the Manila's Triple Action Plan. You can scan it yourself. I won't read it. I suppose in some ways the best known element in that plan is the idea of cessation. The idea <coughs> of a freeze, to quote John Kerry, which again has been rejected by the Philippine government. But at least it's on the record and you can absorb the other elements in that plan at your leisure. <clears throat> this is the, unfortunately, a little bit uh, hard to read, I'm sorry. Uh, this is the latest vertical map from China that shows the nine dash line. What's interesting about this map is that if you look very carefully, and I'm sorry that it's not easier for you to see, the coloration of the border, the land border around Ch Ch uh, China, exactly matches the coloration of the nine dashes. Uh, they are, if you will, laminated dark purple and light purple. And to an untutored observer such as myself, this gives me the impression that those nine dash dashes have the same legal force that the land feature does around China, which actually would lead to the conclusion that the, the China considers the South China Sea to be a lake, its own lake, where it has full spectrum sovereignty. Now, in fairness to our Chinese friends, and you can't see this, but way down in the lower left-hand corner, there is a distinction uh, which does say that that lower line, the nine-dash line, is unsettled. The question is, what does unsettled mean? Does it mean its legality is unsettled? I tend to doubt that. It may simply mean that it's, it has not yet been approved by the international community. I don't really know. But that, at least at the present, it seems to me, illustrates an important part of the Chinese position, which almost uniformly uh, is objected to by the Southeast Asian claimants. <clears throat> now, I want to emphasize this slide because this slide shows us the relative presence of each of these contending claimants in the South China Sea. And it immediately demonstrates that China does not presently dominate the land features of the South China Sea. Yes, it has the Spratleys, having seized those by force. But it, look, it's Vietnam that is by far the best represented among all of the claimants uh, with regard to the Spratleys, and after Vietnam, the Philippines. So in a way, the Chinese position, if I can make this, there we are, um, if I can make these slides work, is we need to play catch up. Look at the largest pieces of land in the Spratleys, you know, from the largest to the less large. These are the top 15. China is not represented except, of course, by Taiwan, which controls Ituaba. And if you consider Taiwan to be part of China, which in a sense it is, you could say that that is Chinese. But at the present time, Taiwan has not completed the process of reintegration into the mainland. And so the position coming from Beijing is really quite understandable. We need to play catch up. While we were sleeping, the Southeast Asians were grabbing, and now it's our turn to grab. If, if one's answer to that is grabbing of any kind doesn't help, you can at least see the sense of victimization. This is not the century of humiliation. This is the decades of unfortunate inattention on part of China as the others establish their positions. So I want to emphasize by saying this. This is my concluding comment. There are no innocents in this game. None. Absolutely none. To reduce the conflict to China versus the US or China versus the world or China versus the Southeast Asia is unhelpful. In fact, the ASEAN members who claim the South China Sea, portions of it, are deeply and centrally part of the problem. And the failure of Hashim Jalal's workshop for more than a decade, two decades, since 1990, illustrates that the blame is plenty enough to go all the way around. And I'm only suggesting that we have options but those options will not be achieved unless the discourse itself corresponds more closely to what Mao suggested. Introspection on the one hand, empathy on the other. <laughs>